left, the far left, is uh, Irene Hurley, who, by the way, is also the head of the library program's volunteers. So we owe her a huge debt of gratitude. Irene is originally from Queens, and she graduated from the Southampton School of Nursing in 1952. Next to Irene is Dolores Zabrowski. Dolores is originally from Sag Harbor. She's from an old Mulvihill family, many generations. And Dolores, by the way, after her time at the hospital school of nursing, volunteered for the US Army Nurses Corps and spent a year, which maybe we'll talk about another time, on a nursing a tra a hospital train. Very interesting. Thank you, Dolores, for being here. Uh, she graduated from in the class of 43. We'll, we'll hold the applause till the end. <laughs> <laughs> Janet Lavinio is next to Dolores. Janet is also a Sag Harbor girl and graduated in the class of 1949. Maureen Roscoe is next. M Maureen is originally from Bayshore, Long Island, and graduated in the class of 1954. And Betty Krzyzewski, who many of you know, is originally from Sag Harbor as well, and graduated in the class of 53. Please welcome our guest. <laughs> Since the uh, women you see up here today all graduated from the School of Nursing, I'd like to, we're going to start by talking about the Southampton Hospital School of Nursing. And I'm going to ask you, Betty, to tell us a little bit about when it started, how it started, okay. et cetera. Uh, it was started by a nurse named Ellen Jacobson, and she was a graduate of St. Luke's Hospital in New York City. And uh, in 1911, I believe, she came out to Southampton to become superintendent of the hospital. And uh, she felt there was a need for nurses and therefore began to uh, think about starting a school of nursing. So in 1924, the uh, first uh, school of nurses were admitted to the hospital. There were five of them. And she had a, a, an associate by the name of Miss Parkin. And Miss Parkin was in charge of the nursing school and Miss Jacobson was a superintendent of the hospital, along with Dr. Creelwright. Um, let me see. Was Dr. Skank at the hospital? Dr. Skank was at the hospital early on also. Okay. Oh, I want to point out that Dr. Skank's great granddaughter is here in the audience. Why don't you stand up? He was. <laughs> old-time doctors, but he's definitely one that people remember as being very special. Okay. Betty, is it a rhetorical question? Were there, was it an all-women's nursing school? It was an all-women's nursing school. <laughs> and um, a lot of the women came from, it was depression. And, and it was a very uh, inexpensive way to get an education. And a lot of the women came from Nova Scotia and Canada. And also local people. And what was the sort of the physical plant like? It was, um, at the time, there were, uh, they opened up different parts of the hospital uh, as different people donated property to, to on Herrick Road mm -hmm. and Meeting House Lane. And it started small and then gradually uh, the men's ward was uh, added with, they say, two piazzas. They were porches. And, uh, and when the patients had their baths in the morning, they'd put them in the wheelchairs on a day like this, and they'd go out and sit in the sun. And uh, the nurses would uh, then make the beds and things, and they would come back. And then... Uh, is that area there at all? That area is still there. And it is now, I believe, medical records and the doctor's lounge. And I think the piazzas are still there. Okay. Yeah. So now, where were you housed? We, in 1925, the nurse's residence was completed for $80,000. And it was a beautiful, beautiful yes. building. And uh, there's a picture of it. Yeah. 
It was um, uh, it was 240 Meeting House Lane, where you go into the hospital now, with it, if you were going in for a test or in the main entrance, and it was uh, right there. And then uh, I think in 1975, it was demolished, unfortunately, because it was a beautiful, beautiful building, and uh, it had um, a basement where the students had their classrooms. There was a nutrition lab, a science lab, a li beautiful library, a classroom where we were all taught by the doctors, and then the tunnel from that um, from downstairs connected uh, to the hospital so that if the girls, if it rained or anything, the girls could always scoot right through the tunnel back and forth. Was it spooky? Yeah. Was it spooky? Yeah. Yeah, it should have. Yeah. 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 just ran sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and then there were um, uh, like three floors, and the floor, and there were, and the south wing was beautiful, where the uh, director of nurses lived and the uh, supervisors. And then on, on the north side, the students lived. We had beautiful rooms. There were some single rooms and some double rooms. And on the third floor, the seniors lived, and it was beautiful. It was <laughs> I just want to add one thing to Betty. The seniors lived on the third floor, and it was beautiful. We loved being up there because, you know, we were so snobbish. <laughs> but there was no heat up there. <laughs> and in the window, one time, my mother came to visit me, and I was in bed, and I had like a corduroy outfit on, and another outfit blank, and I even had the rug off the floor. <laughs> But like today, the people were like, well, I'm not going to put up with that, I'm going to go. Right. We were so, no, don't say right. anything. No, right. We just kept quiet. I told my mother, don't say anything. <laughs> but it was freezing up there. It sounds like they may have wanted to build up your immunity. Right. <laughs> and they did. They were yeah. um, what about the, the size of the classes? Let me ask you. Dolores. Well, now, when you were a little, a few years before oh, your college, quite a here. few years. But there, there was about twenty-five that would start out. Okay. But probably about sixteen would finish. Wow. Yeah. Because they were very strict in almost anything they could buy. You know, they get rid of you. So. Okay. <laughs> and I was uh, impressed to hear what a rigorous school. It's, talk a little bit about how long you had to go and. Well, it was it was uh, uh, you know a three year school, and then later uh, we go away for affiliation from. Um, I was in the class of forty three, so the only place that I went was Brooklyn State for psychiatry. Later on, the state said they had to go away for you know communicable diseases and right. maternity and so forth. Uh, uh, but it was a very it was very good school, a very tough school, and when you finished. The you could, it would just uh, prepare you for life to almost do anything. Right. I was in the army, and the army was never as tough as I was. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were really strict. And she said the director of nursing lived like right in the nursery, room, so they watch you at ten o'clock. You are peeking out their windows and they come around, and you know you get suspended or something if you were trying to get in late. But later on, some of the girls were brave. And they told me that when the place was demolished, uh, they took window panes out of the windows that they would sneak out at night for days. <laughs> I was never afraid. I was just stayed in. Dolores, this was not just three years, but 12 months a year. Yeah, year. So that yes. seems unusual, right. doesn't it, in, in this day and age? Um, Tell us a little bit, I know that all of you have these affiliations. There were, you had fewer than yeah. the others. Janet, you were mentioned. Yes. Tell us a little bit about these affiliations and what was the purpose of them? Well, the state has requirements mm -hmm. for graduation and we have to be trained to handle different things. As Dolores said, we went to Brooklyn State. We're supposed to be uh, the best mental institution in the United States when we went there because we were scared to death. <laughs> and we stay on the floor, this is the side, we all wore, we were in pink. And this man came running across the floor, and he says, the pink whale is here, the pink whale is here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking around, oh, I wanted to go home. <laughs> it was because, I guess, they liked us. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that was our introduction. That was Will for Quincy. <laughs> then we went to Willard Parker, and that was for communicable diseases, because they didn't have measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. They didn't have diphtheria. 
and we had a, a young man from Norway who was on board a ship in New York Harbor who had smallpox. And so that was quite an experience. Um, and then we had, uh, we went to Presbyterian, and my class was the first class that went to Presbyterian. So our director called us all together and said, you're the first class to go, and this is a very high class place. One, you behave yourselves, <laughs> and two, you get good marks. I mean, that's, that was what we were told, and we did, we did, we did. So you represented your Yes, we were representing South very well. well. Then we went to Holtzville, if you remember, Holtzville was the TV center on Long Island for uh, two weeks for tuberculosis training, and then we went to uh, public health uh, for two or three weeks and went out in the field and saw what they did. So we really had a well-rounded education. Right, right. Now, was this a common thing for nursing school? <coughs> I guess teaching hospitals would teach their students on site, but was Southampton unusual in that you went on these affiliations, or was but we were a small hospital, right? right. And we had when I was there 150 patients, right? And so you didn't get enough right. of these things, and so you had to go. What about polio? Oh, well, when I was at Willard Parker in the four, late 40s, we had uh, the polio epidemic here, and uh, the only thing that we could do for them was the hot packs. And we ran out of electrical machines, so then they doubled up two of us, and they had a wooden thing, and we put the towels on it, and then we twirled it, and then put it on the patients. And we, we had blisters on our hands because they didn't give us rubber gloves or anything like that. And so we could treat the patients. Then when we came back to Southampton, we had all received a wonderful education in the treatment of polio, and we had a, an epidemic out here. And so uh, the nurses that were working there hadn't been trained like we students, so the um, supervisors decided that they were going to turn the pediatric unit into a polio ward. And they took all of us students and we went in different shifts when we covered it until the uh, epidemic calmed down. Right. Wow. Um, <clears throat> I know that penicillin wasn't used by then, by the time that you all were but not for a long time, particularly Doris. You well, made some nurses. I know when the penicillin <coughs> came out, and only the head nurse could give it. We were taught how to make it. We'd have to walk around a little tray and give to the, to the patients. It was that, it was that new, you know, that we did it. And in answer to your question, did other people go on affiliations? Yes, a lot of the schools of our size were upstate. And when we would go like to Brooklyn State, which is the one I went, all of, the, all of the students would have different uniforms, okay. and we were very happy because we had the best uniforms. <laughs> well, let's, I mean, I want you to talk about uniforms. Well, let me tell you about the uniforms. And by the way, you were going to see a couple of these nurses in uniform. <laughs> but you will see a hat. And <laughs> the uniform was always worn complete. You never were seen without the bib. You were never seen with stockings that were falling down. <laughs> you always had your shoes polished. The hair should not touch the collar of a uniform. Makeup neatly applied. No nail polish, no rings. Now to get into the uniform <laughs> took a little time. <laughs> now the uniform was highly starched and it was made of this pink and white material. Now it wasn't just a dress underneath. It had a set in belt that went around the waist and it buttoned there. But this set in belt was many thicknesses of fabric. So you were in there tight. The front of the uniform up to here was double. The sleeves were double and triple on the cuff and across the back. This was highly starched and buttoned midway down the waist. Now, the collar was very, very stiff. And you took the collar and you rubbed it on a bar of ivory soap 
so that it wouldn't make your neck bleed. <laughs> you put the collar on and somehow it had two tails and you put a pin right here. And to the pin you attached a rubber band. And the rubber band you attached to your bra. So you were on the skin very tight. So then over that you put the bib. Now the bib was only worn after you received your cap in probation. The bib went on over your head and then you crisscrossed it in the back. But in order to hold that down, you had a band. And it was called the chastity belt. <laughs> so you put that around yourself and pinned it in front. And you crisscrossed it in the back and you put two pins in the back. Now, you're not late yet. You're going to be late in a minute. Now, over that went an apron. And every day we had a clean apron. Only two pink uniforms a week, but a clean apron every day. The apron was a gathered and went completely around you. And um, it was also double banded and highly starched. <laughs> now the apron had two buttonholes in the back and you had two studs and you tightened that on yourself. And between the buttonholes you wore your scissors. It hooked in there. So you were always able to have your scissors. And your scissors were part of your uniform. And when a doctor asked you for your scissors, you had better have it. And if you were not polished, clean, and immaculate, you were spoken to. And that's how we got dressed every day. And this took like maybe 10 minutes. And whenever we got called to the hospital, you had to be in complete uniform. So we were a little restricted. <laughs> what was the length of your dresses? Um, it came below the knee at that time. And on the top, we wore the cap. And the cap had to be lovely and clean. And we made the cap ourselves. It was hem stitch. We were taught how to do the hem stitching. And while we were learning the hem stitching, the directress of nursing told us stories about the history of nursing. And she went into all sorts of famous people. So we were always doing something. <laughs> I mean, was there any way that anyone could possibly sort of personalize their uniform? Or that or that it doesn't sound doesn't the, sound. Later on we personalized the cap because early on it was like a strawberry box that fit on your head. And then we started to make the wings and then classes later on folded them smaller. But it's just the size of a linen napkin, and it was designed so that we could travel all over the world, and we would still have our cap. There's the cap. Very nifty. And, okay, let's talk about how you got these clean, laundered, and ironed. Well, uh, when I was there in 43, a long time ahead of these girls, but anyway, when I got there, one of the girls in the operating room she was always cold, I told you. It was never seen. So she put an iron in her bed to keep her warm. And she got called for the operating room. So the middle time, the bed, I guess, got on fire. So when I got there, we were all, the whole school was punished, and we couldn't use an iron. Now, it was okay for me because I lived in Sag Harbor, but the rest of the people, we had to have these irons, and then we'd heat them. And that's what we had an eye in our school. This really, the conditions sound like something out of Charles Dickens. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we'll wait till you hear what they had to do in the hospital, but still we're just finishing up with the, with the school itself there. How was the, the food? Did you, did you have to cook? No. <laughs> When we went home, that's what we did. We, when we had a day off, we'd sleep or we'd eat. Because Miss Jacobson, I think it was from Norway, and she had a garden. So we had to eat out of the garden. And, you know, so we had plenty of salads. But we were really starving. 
And one was called and then she tells us it's so healthy, it's got this vitamin, and one was called Mac Toast. And maybe well if you can tell what was that. Mac toast? Mac toast? What was that? We get it all the time. It's not like toast. McDonald's, is no. It? No. 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 <laughs> no. No, but the farmers used to donate yeah. a lot oh, yeah. of produce yeah, yeah, yeah. and the hunters would bring yeah. in the deer oh, meat. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. but, but, we, to bring us but we never knew what we were eating. <laughs> <laughs> it was always uh, hot roast, <laughs> and hamburgers, <laughs> and stew meat, but not deer meat, but <laughs> what we, we were eating, we, we had a half hour for lunch or dinner, and sometimes we didn't get off in time, so we had 10 minutes, so we learned to eat very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so we could eat, and when I was there, uh, we ate all the food, we didn't have a car to go yeah. somewhere, you had five bucks in your pocket for a month, so, you know, you ate it. It was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and the doctors were very good. Dr. Edwards used to bring his fish, lobsters, and oh, put them in the, uh, in the ice box at the resident. You'd open the ice box and you'd find a lot of things from the doctors if they had fish. Very That's good. great. And you said that, Janet, that uh, Mr. Norsick? Mr. Norsick used to go shooting, you know. So he used to bring the ducks. That's very right. a lot from Mr. Morsick, I remember. Now, you did have to prepare food for some patients, didn't we you? We did. Only with special diets. Yes. Okay. When Mrs. Lewis was our uh, dietitian, oh, and oh god, she was wonderful. So refined and such a nice lady. And so we had courses first in dietetics, and then we were assigned to the diet kitchen. And so if a patient was on a special diabetic diet, she would have a list up there of how many calories and how many, how much carbohydrate and how much protein and so on, how much fat, and say, well, this is a 1,200 calorie diet. Now you figure out what the patient can have, and then you have exchanges. So you did the diabetics, you did the low fat, you did low salt, bland diets. But the worst thing of all, and thank God for the Nexium and all those wonderful drugs, people with ulcers. And they stayed in the hospital for a long time at sippy diets. So every hour from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., you had to give the patient three ounces of sippy cream, which was a mixture of milk and 20% cream. Then, that was the first three days. From four to ten days, they were allowed to have a soft-boiled egg three times a day, and um, they could have cream wheat or farina, very fine, like at 1 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and 7 o'clock, as if we didn't have enough to do. <laughs> and then we had to make sure we marked down, we had to go and check the trays from the patients to make sure that we could tell Mrs. Lewis, yes, my patient ate all this, or my patient didn't eat, why didn't they eat it? And it was, you know, but it prepared us, because I never cooked. My mother was a wonderful cook, she didn't want anybody in the kitchen. So I thought, oh, and it was wonderful, because she taught us how to cook everything. Um, Betty, what would a, a typical day, if there was such a thing, um, uh, look like for, for the nursing students? Okay. Like what time you got up and what you did and all well, that. Well, uh, we, would, we would get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and um, it would not be unusual for the nursing instructor to come knock at your door and say, be in class at 7 o'clock, if she made up her mind to that. But generally, we would get up at 6 a.m. and we would get dressed and we would go to the dining room and have Mr. Eggert's wonderful rolls from Hampton Bakery and bacon and jelly. And uh, that's where I started. I never drank coffee till I got to the hospital. Then I would have a cup of coffee. And if, you, if some of your friends wanted to stay in bed, when they heard you rustling about to go to uh, the dining room, bring me back a roll with bacon. <laughs> and then we'd always bring somebody back something to eat. And then we would, um, we would meet in, in a, 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 it was called the EENT room, um, and the instructor would come. This is when we were first young students. And she would tell us where we had to go, who we had to bathe, who we had to feed, and that would be from like, say, 8 to 10, <coughs> 10 o'clock, we would go to class. Okay. Right there in the nursery. Right, right in the down in the basement. And so who was teaching you? Well, we had, um, the doctors would teach us um, 
medicine and surgery. Your father taught us medicine, Dr. Wright. Dr. Corwith taught us surgical uh, nursing, and uh, Dr. Cancellari taught uh, uh, dermatology, and uh, Dr. Gaynor and Dr. Rubler taught about medicine. We, uh, that's, and then they had certain nursing arts instructors like Miss Betty Gold and Miss Del Rogerson. She taught us anatomy and physiology. We have, Sounds like, I mean, this, it's not unusual to have all the doctors you're working with, so you they were, were very, very good. You were good getting good yeah, training. Yeah. 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 Dr. Bellows. Oh, yeah, yeah, she's from Rutherford. She yeah. took OB and GYN. Yeah. Yeah. She did. Um, all right, so then you had your classes. Then did you go over to the hospital? Then you had lunch, right? And we had lunch, and then uh, we, might, we may have then gone back to class, and if we had split shifts, we'd go maybe from like 3 to 7 for evening care. Because everybody got washed uh, before dinner and then before they went to bed, of course, they had their back rubbed and all and ready to bed. Now, so, I want, let's talk just a little bit about how many functions you all performed. Because it, I think there's very little resemblance to the way hospitals are staffed today. Is that, is that right? Right. right? I mean, how many orderlies were there? What were you doing? Oh, the, the I have a good orderly story. Okay. Uh, <laughs> first of all, we didn't have any. And we were doing all these heavy patients. And we kept complaining. They're really heavy to uh, you know, get on a stretcher and so forth. So finally, in my day, they hired an orderly. And he lasted about one month because he ran away with one of my classmates. <laughs> <laughs> the girl said to one of my friends, could I borrow your suitcase for the weekend? <laughs> I never saw the suitcase. <laughs> but you asked a question, and I don't think if you're aware, the nursing students ran the hospital. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, we were the only people. The head nurses were there, and then we had a day and night supervisor. And by the way, they had their own dining room, and that was you know you couldn't. They, they were taught. They were everybody was like in a class here, and they had their own dining. Room. But we ran the hospital until about 1940, I think, before I left to go there. They uh, all of a sudden I saw this registered nurse. And I said, I went to the head nurse, I said, who was she? She said, well, she's a staff nurse. Like, that's the first nurse, you know, other than us. Right. Isn't that yeah. amazing? Yeah, we were in the hospital. Amazing. But you know, what, just one yeah, yeah. you know what was nice about when we were in nursing school? That when you came on duty, you had like four or five patients assigned to you. You did everything for them, medications, and, uh, you know, anything, bedside nursing, uh, dietary, everything. So you got to know your Something patient. like bathe, yes. clothes, every, every and treatment. And the doctors would come in, and you would go on rounds with the doctors, and you could tell him everything yes. that was happening with that patient, which isn't today. No. That was the nice part. I, I was recently in a big university hospital up our Turkey on and the, nurse, the nurses were terrific, but they come in and they say, I'm your nurse, I'm Betty. And my answer was, I better take a good look at you, because I'm never going to see you again. <laughs> 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 um, you know, uh, Sarah or something. Every day uh, you had a different nurse. Right. And, and you're right, we, we do everything about the patients. Right. That the patient stayed longer yeah, with right. that, you know, yeah, seven or ten days. Right. So you got to know? Yeah, and um, in OB, women having babies yeah, certainly is best. Um, Irene, you were going to well, say a few words about that. Day. At, at that time, Mother stayed in the hospital for five days, and you were a bed patient the first 24 hours. And, um, and the babies used to come out to the mother, and the mother would be the babies, and the babies were taken away very rapidly, and the fathers had to look at the babies through the window. And if you were breastfeeding your baby, which was unheard of in the 50s, no one breastfed their babies. I breastfed babies, and I was constantly reprimanded by the nursery nurse that the baby was not getting enough to eat. And being the only, you know, you were almost in tears. But, you know, I stuck it out. And it wasn't until maybe the 80s that there was a renewed interest in breastfeeding. 
But prior to that, the nurses in the nursery prepared the formula for all the babies. And you made the formula, you sterilized it, you put it into certain bottles, you labeled the bottles. And OB was a, a place where sometimes mothers formed lasting friendships because they were in the same room with another mother for five days. So OB was a nice place. As opposed to being in the room with your baby, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but, um, uh, were the babies fed? I assume it was not on demand, right? It was a schedule. Oh, no. Schedule. You came to the schedule. <laughs> and you know, it was not unusual for that in that time where women had multiple babies that, and she had young children at home, she would board the baby in the hospital for two, three days and go home and reunite herself with her activities and her other children. And the, one of the purposes were to get that baby on a routine. <laughs> and so, you know, the nurses stuck to the routine. So OB was really different. I want to change the subject for just a minute. We're going to get back to that. But I just recall being struck by several of you remarking about the level of formality between doctors and nursing students, and even amongst yourselves. Somebody talk about that a little bit. Um, Maureen, want to say a few oh, words about that? OK. Um, well, if a doctor came into the nurse's station, you stood up. Listen to this. You said, they asked you for the patient's chart. You gave it to them. And you were like, stand up and listen. <laughs> they would give the orders and everything, and you would go over them. And I mean, we respected every doctor that we worked with. And that isn't today as you see it. But that's the way we were trained. Betty, what did they call you? I mean, I mean, not just you, but uh, well, that you would they you were called you. Miss Miss yes. Browngar. They would yes. call me, and uh, you and you would never ever call a doctor by his first name. And to this day, I have a hard time. I, I wouldn't. I, I still call. I don't, if I see Doctor Panabianco, who was very very worked all the years with him, I he's calling me Richess. I can't. <laughs> it's just ingrained in yeah. you. You know. It was born. How did you refer to each other in, in company of doctors and other well, like hospital personnel? When you first went in, you were called a probie. Mm -hmm. And that was like the lowest thing that you could do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then, then uh, as I remember, like in my class, uh, you know, like the seniors wouldn't even speak to you. I mean, they were mean to you. you know? <laughs> and everybody couldn't wait to be a senior. Right. So they could be mean to <laughs> <laughs> but but the, head, the head nurses, uh, like they all sat to, in the dining room, they, they had their own table and everything. At one, at one time they had their own dining room, but if they sat at the other one, they'd all sit together. Right. So it was very, and they all, we all called, uh, as you say, our head nurses, Miss, we didn't call yes. by their first name. Never. 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 And what about each other? Would you, in, in oh, the yes. company of doctors, would you refer to each other in formal, or a formal way or just first names? As nursing students, how, did you have any interaction with the local community here? Were you your own? Sounds like you were pretty self-sufficient. It sounds like you probably didn't have a lot of time off. But if well, you did, what did you do? Well, we didn't have that much time off. And um, <laughs> we went to the beach. Got you know, terribly sunburned. We could walk down to the beach. And we always walked to the village, I think, almost once a day. And you could get a Coke in Rini's for five cents, a cherry Coke for five cents. And um, most of, a lot of the students lived close by. If you lived in Sand Harbor, for instance, you would go home more frequently. But the students who lived, like myself, in, towards the city, you did not go home that frequently. So because I was in the residence for a long time, I was able to bond with some of the upperclassmen because they were there also. As far as the community, um, they recognized you on the street. I remember getting a ride to church by Henry Ford, but you were not, you were never asked to join a bowling league locally. 
there was not much interaction with the community other than the church, going to church if you had time. But there was interaction with the males of the community. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how we socialized. <laughs> and what kind of opportunities did you have to get together with young men? <laughs> well, they didn't have to lay that out for us. <laughs> So then you'd be sleeping, and then somebody would wake you up. They say, Miss Jacobin wants you, and you'd have to get up, and you'd have to be like they had the summer girls of the that was the celebrities. You know, a lot of people, the girls who belong to the beach club and so forth, and they were volunteering for the summer. So uh, Miss Jacobs wanted to teach them things like this. And so we had to go over and be the model, like when they gave us a bath or something. So we finally got to the point that we'd get up in the morning, we'd get off duty, and we'd go down to the beach to hide. <laughs> Did you have a nighttime curfew? Oh, oh yeah, 10 p.m. 10 p.m. Yep. Yeah. Were you allowed to have visitors in your rooms? No. <laughs> The Gabor sisters. Oh yes. Um, who else? The lady who wrote the music to on um, Chattanooga and the Choo Choo. I took care oh. of her. She had pancreatitis. Oh, I'm glad you remember that. And I took care of Charles Gorin. He was a gentleman oh. who uh, wrote on bridge. Bridge. Yes. Right. Yes. yes. Were there? Oh, and were there stars? things that stood yeah. out? I mean, were they? Did they bring any of their own hired help with them? Or they oh. sometimes they had private duty nurses. They had private duty very nurses. well in, in, in that in the fifties. They're very very wealthy people lived in Southampton. It's yeah. not like now. Right. And if if they became ill, they would have their private room. They'd have their own nurses, and their maids would come in in the morning with beautiful trays, all lovely china, coddled eggs, and we'd be. <laughs> Oh, everything cream. It was fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they brought their own nurses, but were their nurses in charge of what was happening, or were you? So they had nurses. Nurse. Yeah, they had to see yeah. Yeah. nurses. But, that, but, but, they, did, but, but they did everything for them. Yeah. Right. Did they appreciate your you know, being there, yes. or were they oh, yes. mostly they were, nice? Yes. They were very nice. Very nice people. Now, in addition to the celebrities, I know several of you have talked about long-term patients. Very long-term. Mm -hmm. They Hotel live there. Southampton. Hotel Southampton. Hotel Southampton. Let's talk about that a little bit, a few of you. Well, I, I, can I tell you about Elizabeth Morton Tilton? Yes. <laughs> Elizabeth Morton Tilton lived in the hospital for a long time, and uh, there was a particular superintendent who said, well, she has to move. She can't stay here any longer. She wasn't sick. No, but she was. So um, she threw her will out the window, <laughs> and, and um, someone picked it up and it read where she was going to leave this huge amount of money to the hospital. And Mr. Paul Abbott, who at the time was like on the uh, board of directors, he said to the superintendent, "She stays, or you go." <laughs> <laughs> A long stay. How long could years, the long be? Years. 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 Okay, talk about Jen. Wait, let's start again. Mrs. McGran was on the second floor, private room, private nurses, and she was there for years and years and years. And we hardly ever saw her because her nurses were very careful that we didn't sneak a peek. <laughs> Mrs. Van Ingen was different. She was up on West 3, and the doctors used to come in in the morning and have coffee. And so then we would peek in and see all of these. You know, and, uh, now, with, with the long-term... Granny term, Harper. 
Oh, okay. she was a local resident in Southampton. She had a darling little house over there on Lewis Street. And Alice Blydenberg, who was our supervisor, before that, she was her private duty nurse. And she lived there until she died. She was a grand old gal. So, so, so your services weren't necessarily no. required with these no, long-term. No no, 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 no. Now, what about Zella de Milner? Zella oh, Zella, Zella de Milo. Yes. She was my patient. She was a kid. I loved her, right? Was that? Tell us about Zella, her. Zella de Milo. She, oh, oh Zellora. She were and I were working on, on private two when she was a patient. Okay. She, she would have had some sort of an oil she put on her and it stunk. <laughs> <laughs> but when she died, Dolores was bad. When she died, we, we had cardexes and, and uh, the patient's name and diagnosis and everything. So I went on duty one morning, we're giving the report. And there was a little cross, and it says, "Here lies the body of Zilla." <laughs> 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 yeah, it's just on that. Oh, God. But she was a wonderful she was artist, a and she also didn't she was a pilot in World War II. She did some. She, she drove an ambulance over in France. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of dying, I think I read somewhere that when somebody died, you had to be on an elevator that. Right. We had a special. Okay. Talk about that a little bit. Sorry, you've been too many people doing more. All right, so let's go through the scenario. All Someone people, dies. We, we all had guests, so we, we uh, fixed the person, you know, put them on the stretcher, and we had to get into this old elevator that was creaky. And one time, I had a person with me, and we got stuck. <laughs> and I almost panicked to myself. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was a nervous wreck. But anyway, pushed the button, and we got the mechanic to come and fix it, and we went yes. down. But all of us had to do those certain things. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we all had to take turns and learn everything. Do you remember that we had a guard? You know, yeah, the elevator was not a push button. You had to do it yourself. <laughs> and oh, then you try to get it even with the floor. Even with the floor. Even with the floor. Even with the floor. And we used to laugh. I mean, I mean, it was terrible. But how could you not laugh? I mean, it was so such a sad thing that you're doing, and you can't get the patient into the morgue. I mean, it was terrible. <laughs> Couldn't get him out of the elevator. No. <laughs> and the worst part, we had to go by ourselves. Oh yes. Uh, uh, you know, yeah, that's that we was, didn't have. A we were very young. Was yeah. it? Was it? You must have been affected by deaths oh, at oh, these yeah. young ages. Yeah, very sad. Really, not Did you have many young patients who you became attached to? Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was there a favorite department to work in? You know, women's work, men's work. Men's work. Yes. <laughs> in the world. One time I was working at the men's ward, and like I was on night duty, and of course you're, you're all alone. You know, we didn't have all these helpers and aides and everything. So I'm sitting at the desk, and all of a sudden I turn around, and this man is walking out from and he's got a, a big sheet around him, and he scared me to death. And uh, so anyway, I knew his wife had died the day before. And so I said, why don't you sit down here with me, and I'll get you a cup of tea or something. So anyway, he sat down, and uh, you know, I got him tea or some toast or something. And I was doing the chart, and he just sat there for a while. And then finally I said, you know, it's better, you better go back to bed. And the next day he went home, and the next night, he hung himself. Oh. And when, when I heard that, I said, oh my God, I hope yeah. he wasn't going to do that. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I had to sit down that day. You know. yeah. Yeah. Well, we had a, a patient on the men's ward who ran away with a shin. He was supposed to have surgery the next day, and um, he just hid in the bathroom when the nurse wasn't looking on duty and he wrapped himself in the sheet and he ran home because he didn't want to have surgery. And he was in the state of shock. You know, what, what could you do? Right. He never came back. <laughs> <laughs> so occasionally that happened. Did you, did you ever mix patients up or babies or? No. No. <laughs> now what about James Parrish, the son of Samuel Parrish? Wasn't he a long-term? Mm -hmm. Mr. Parrish was a long-term patient on Private Two, and uh, he re didn't require any care. He just lived there. Mm -hmm. And I can remember when I worked evenings, every evening his chauffeur would come, and Mr. Parrish would go to the South Engine Club for dinner, <laughs> and then Mr. Parrish would come back, get off of the elevator, and go back to his room. Oh. <laughs> Were any of the long-term guests friendly with each other? No. 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 Okay. 
Very interesting. Um, what about pranks? Did you? I have three quick stories. Okay, we want we want pranks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Morning. We're in the nurse. We're in the residence, and my classmate Kay Nicholson is back there. We decided we wanted to toast marshmallows, so we started the fire in the waste can, and we had stirrers, and we had the marshmallows toasting and dripping, and the house mother comes running down, and we all ran in the bathroom, and one of the state, I don't know if it was Kay, stayed out, said, we smell something burning in here, and said, oh, no, nobody's in here, we're all in the bathtub, and it's burning pot. The next, the next quick one, we were, I was working with my dear friend Betty, and we were working nights on, uh, on the floor, and we decided we weren't busy, we had everything under control, so we went to the dictaphone machine. And we started, and Betty said, don't worry, we'll just sing and do everything, <laughs> and, uh, and we'll erase it. So anyway, right there. Singing, hi, Mrs. Smoking Scrum, how are you today? And singing and singing, and Betty's going on, and we're singing all these songs. So I went off duty the next morning, and Betty was still there. And uh, Dr. Wright, Penny's dad, went down to record his messages. <laughs> and I guess he's down there, and all of a sudden, all this singing comes on. And, he goes to the medical record lady and she comes stamping up Betty said and trying to figure out who whose voices were on it. <laughs> Till this day they still call me Mrs. Muckins. <laughs> <laughs> the last one is we were working nights again and we were starving, so one of us ran down, we got a chicken out of the refrigerator at the diet kitchen. So we were gonna cook it up there in the oven and all of a sudden an accident came in and we were so busy so we threw the chicken up in the cupboard in the nurse's lounge, forgot all about it, which was in August, and all of a sudden you know what happened. Oh, that stink was horrible. Rotting. But anyway, none of the patients died. We had lots of fun. It was a great, great time. But if you got caught with an infraction, oh, was, yeah. there, was, was the punishment? Or was oh, there? Yeah, we probably would have gotten. We were bad. afraid that was the end. <laughs> After the dictaphone <laughs> accident, I thought I was going to be fired. And Maureen and, and Barbara Andrews, Barbara Rayner, they were just about two weeks from graduation, uh -huh. and we were frightened to death. <laughs> but and they and they actually took this record and they ran and, they, and let the director of nurses listen to that and listen to the voices. I think she knew who who we were, and it never was revealed. Well, that's good. Uh, yeah. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about a few of the old time doctors that that you? knew about, like Dr. Skank, did you hear stories about some of those? What about Dr. Bellows? Well, Dr. Bellows was a dream, kindest, and so smart. And she was so probably the first woman. Yes, yeah, she was. She was. Mm -hmm. Right. She was did she have a general practice? Yes. And when she had OB call, mm -hmm. she walked from <laughs> her, on her home on <clears throat> Hampton Road over to the hospital. And in those days, we didn't call the doctor until the last minute. And we used to look out the window to see if she was coming. And she'd come heading along. And then she'd do the delivery. And then she'd want a cigarette. And she would ask you for a cigarette. And lots of times, she would go right, you know, into the nurse's lounge where someone may have left their pocketbook. And she'd go right in there, get a cigarette. And she'd come out and say, I, I just had a cigarette. And she'd be smoking in the hall. But every Christmas, she always gave the nurses cartons of cigarettes. <laughs> Did you smoke in the hospitals? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody yeah. smoked. Everybody smoked. Patients, doctors, visitors, everybody. There was smoked. always a fire. Patient, one time, Barbara Fanning, I think, uh, <laughs> <laughs> One of the patients were, uh, were smoking and the mattress caught on fire and Barbara Fanning and Carolyn Vinsky took the mattress quickly and brought it out in the wall and poured water all over it and put the fire out. I mean, they were always 
smoking and getting bed on fire. It was terrible. <laughs> how, speaking of times were different, things were very different. How much did it cost to uh, stay in the hospital back then? So, what were some of the bills that you all brought in? Or doctors' visits would have cost just a few dollars. Is that sure. correct? Yeah, I yeah, used to charge fifty cents. Fifty cents. And surgery, less than. Oh, less oh, surgery. How much? Fifteen, fifteen or twenty dollars at the most. No health insurance. No. no. You didn't need it. Did no welfare. And what about? Uh, Litigation, lawsuits. No. 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 no, no. They did have a free bed fund, they called it. And Mrs. Uh, Ella King who was a wonderful lady. She uh, was ahead of this uh, committee, and they would have bake sales and everything to put this money into the free bed fund so that if you were unable to pay your bill, that money would come out of the free bed fund. She was a great lady. How about tuition at your school? $500. Very inexpensive. For all the three years. Well, 73 years. Yeah. 75. When I was there, it was nothing. Yeah, me too. Zero. Well, they certainly got a lot of work out of it. <laughs> <laughs> they were, you know, as you said, the nurses ran the hospital. I went in training in 1946, and the war was over 45, so all the women nurses were pregnant. So that's why there was so few of us there. So when I applied, I said, how much is the tuition? And they said zero. Wow. So that's How much would you expect to make as a trained nurse when you... I made, I was How much a nurse on pediatrics, I made $35 a week for six and a half days a week. And this was in what years? 1949. $35 a week? $35 a week. Which nurse. would be $50, but how much a year? Not much. No. Not much. Well, I know one year I made $2,500. One year. And, and I was talking to somebody and they said, well, I made $25,000. But twenty five thousand or twenty no, but wasn't a nurse. I mean I was talking right. to somebody who said, oh. I made twenty five hundred. But I remember when I graduated, I got sixty dollars a month but room and board. You know, when I worked in the right. <laughs> Did any of you go into private duty work? I did a lot of private duty. Okay. I took care of Miss uh, Madame Valson for two summers mm -hmm. and went flew down to Florida with her and brought her. Mm -hmm. And I took care of a, a lady called Mrs. Thorpe, who was oh, yeah. Marvel oh, Wins, yeah. Um, yeah. mother from Philadelphia. And then I took care of a very, very brilliant woman who lived in Hampton Bays. Mm. Uh, Olive, I can't think of her last, last name now. But she was a writer. And, uh, yeah. so was, yeah. oh, all in all, how do you feel that your training served you in the nursing school? And Best in the world. Very well. Couldn't ever, ever get what we got. It helped us to be better mothers. Mm -hmm. It helped us to be better members of the community. And it helped us to like ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in the Army, so I was with nurses from all over school. Right. And I, I never felt that they were any better nurses than I. Right. And I just want to take one minute, because Betty will laugh about this. We used, in, in Southampton, we used to make flaxseed pulp oh, yes. and turpentine stoves. Oh, and one time I was working in California, and the doctor said, like this a turpentine stove, and none of the nurses knew what he was talking about. And I said, I know how to do that. And he said, what a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I think 
Dr. Brown told the story, which may have been in an interview with me, but Mary wrote it up in her book about being surprised to come out here to Southampton and having women like with a Bunsen burner making morphine or something. Yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> and he said, this hasn't happened for 50 years. <laughs> so there were some old ways. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> so, but it sounds like you were well trained in the, in the new ways. And how about, so you, you it sounds as though you feel that you all got good training. Oh, yes. 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 We're confident and I would imagine these skills would carry over. Mm -hmm. And how about your professional lives as nurses? Did you, how do you feel about what you've done, spent your lives doing, Betty, starting with you? Well, I, I, I was mainly a um, hospital nurse. I never, I maybe did one. when. I went to California with two girlfriends and worked out in California in 1955 and then when I came home my mother worked in the bakery in Sac Harbor and I was going to have a rest and my mother said, oh I found a job for you. <laughs> <laughs> I was my mother. But it was it happened to be on Quimby Lane in Bridgehampton, a lovely old family by the name of uh, the Wileys. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Wiley was the son of the John Wiley Publishing Company uh, and I, I was with them for a few weeks and then I started uh, I was in charge of women's ward, and then I got married, and and I had um, a ch a three ch a three children, right? 57, 58, and 59. But then we continued working, and I and I worked ever since then. But I loved every moment of it. I used to go to work and say, "I'm getting paid for this." And we had we had lots of friends, and we worked hard. We worked together. We would do patients up together, and it was a wonderful, wonderful time in my life. And I have, oh, I have wonderful here. friends now forever. Oh, How yeah. about the rest of you? Did, did you know? Well, after I graduated, I went to OB for mm -hmm. six months and then into the operating room. Mm -hmm. So uh, that I really liked. Mm -hmm. And that's where I stayed till well, I got married and I was still in the OR. And then I had my five children, so it got to the point, yeah. you know, you could go back in the summers and you could get somebody to watch your children. And uh, from then on, I just, when I got out of that, I went into private duty. And at that time, you would have, uh, you know, the wealthy people that lived here, that's where you got a lot of private duty in the hospital. But once they opened the cardiac care in ICU, that sort of terminated right. a lot of the cases, and it went from the hospital right. to the home. Right. Okay. We just have a couple more minutes to, you know, for the filmed part of our program. <laughs> anyway, how about the rest of you, just briefly? You, you yeah, I did all kinds of nursing, right. hospital nursing, <coughs> working with doctors in the offices. I worked at the nursing home. I worked at the medical group in East Hampton. Mm -hmm. And uh, then my last job was as the school nurse in the South Haven High School, yeah. and it was right. just wonderful, wonderful. But yes. the training that I got in South Haven Hospital right. is what made, is what made the job work. possible. Yes. You, know, you right. do things there right. on your own, right. so it was one, I've had a wonderful <laughs> career. Well, when I got out of the Army, I went to the GI Bill of Rights. So I went to school, you know, on that, and I got my BS and my Master's. Right. And then, uh, I had relatives out in California, and I went out there, worked for a while, went around. But I was always a hospital nurse. Right. And then I came back and I taught in the school of nursing, and then became the director. But I liked the hospital. The uh, hospital right. part. But uh, I feel the same as Janet. Yeah. It just prepared. It, and right. you can own nothing ever right. in your life. You can right. always face everything. Right. No matter what came, you can face it right. because of our training. I, okay. it's true. How about you? One last I had a wonderful career. I worked on floors. I worked on OB. I worked in the ER. I worked in ambulatory. I worked in the GI department. So I had a very, very career. I was constantly moving around, learning something new. I think that we owe a huge debt of gratitude to you, to other nurses who came before and after you for everything you've done for all of us. And I want to really thank you for coming here today and talking about your work. It's been wonderful having you here.